Okay, this is the second hour of Physics 1C for February 23rd, and we're going to be talking about uh, what are called electric field lines. Now, this is a type of visual representation of an electric field around an object, and it's something that uh, you can kind of get a feel for by just uh, drawing the electric field vectors all around an object. Um, so let's start off with um, some kind of rules about these, these things. Uh, so the rules for these are basically that um, any field line that we're going to draw uh, begins on a positive charge. And end or terminate on a negative charge. Assuming you have them, if you just have one charge, it'll just kind of go away from the positives and towards the negatives. And um, if you have more of one charge than the other charge, then the lines uh, will be end or begin infinitely far away. The second rule for field lines is um, the number of field lines that leave a positive charge or approach a negative charge is going to be proportional to the size of the charge. So basically I'll say this is the number of field lines uh, leaving a positive charge should be proportional to the size of the charge. And same thing for negative charges. And then within any picture that we draw of these field lines, um, two lines can never cross. And we'll see why that is pretty quickly. And there's some other general rules that we can make about them, but these are the ones that we're gonna start with. I guess the fourth one I would say is that uh, any point um, on a field line is going to be tangent to uh, the electric field vector at that location. So we can basically use this last rule as a way to describe how these lines are drawn. Okay, it's a lot of writing, but uh, there's, there's kind of an introduction to an idea of what they are. Okay, so let me draw just two simple sets of field lines to give you an idea of how this would work. So let's say that we start off and I give you a, uh, a positive, let's pick a number. Let's start off with the number uh, one, because that's, uh, let's start with two, that's easy to work with. So we'll do plus two nanocoulombs, okay? Let's say that I have a charge that is drawn as plus two nanocoulombs, and I wanna figure out the direction of the electric field lines, okay? So the, the general way you would go about doing this is you would use your knowledge of electric field vectors to start drawing the lines, basically, okay? And I'm recording, right? Okay. So if we were to go to, let's say, a point right here, what would the direction of the electric field vector be? We know that it's going to point away up in that direction, right? We know that these electric field vectors get weaker the farther away you go. And the closer you get, the bigger they get, okay? But they all kind of tend to lie along a line. So if I want to draw an electric field line at this location, then all I have to do is to draw a line that's kind of tangent to every single one of these, right? So let's do that. Um, that one didn't kind of line up as well. So our electric field line for this would basically just point straight out like that. And any point that we go to around here, we could we could draw similar field lines, right? So let's draw eight lines 
drawn radially away from this object. And as much as I can, I'm going to try to space them evenly apart from each other. Okay, so I don't want to have a bunch of extra lines down here. This is supposed to be kind of a uniform distribution of these field lines. Okay? Now, they're not straight, but you can imagine that they should be basically just straight lines that emanate out from this. And we'll look at, we'll look at better versions of these here in a second. Okay? By comparison, let's say in a completely different location, so let's say that this is separated from the next picture that I'm going to draw. Let's say that I wanted to draw the electric field lines for a negative 1 nanocoulomb charge. What do I know needs to be different according to my rules? Got to point in. They have to point in, that's right. So let's start off by drawing lines like this, 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 right? They should all point in. And this one, this one over here is really bad, so we're going to... Let's just, okay, like this. Now, the question now is, should I draw more lines? So with the two nanocoulomb charge, I drew eight lines. With this one, I've drawn four, and that's because of rule number two. The number of field lines leaving a positive charge should be proportional to the size of the charge. Same thing is true for negatives, right? Um, so if, if I'm saying that this is two and this is one, then I'm gonna draw half as many field lines. Does that make sense? If I wanted to draw, just to kind of keep with the pattern, if we take, again, another completely isolated object and I throw in here a um, four nanocoulomb charge, if I want to keep with the same kind of uh, relative sizes of what I've drawn so far for my pictures of these fields, then how many lines should I draw coming out of the 16. Field? 16, exactly. So we got to go... We have to start maybe just with the eight. So there's four. Let's cut those in half to get eight. Again, the whole goal here is to make these really, really nicely spread out as evenly as you possibly can. And now basically we just need to come in here and bisect each of these. So now this should be the electric field for my four nanocoulomb charge. Now I'm, I have to also draw arrows on here. Now these electric field lines, I want to emphasize, they're not real things. They are just pictures that we use to help us understand the way that the electric field works in different situations. So there we go. You can see there's a lot more density. In fact, the density of the lines is directly proportional to the strength of the field. I'll just say the strength of the electric field. Okay. The places where the lines are the most dense are the places where the field is the strongest. So where are the lines the most dense on this picture? In this region here, right? The closer that you are to the object, the more kind of lines per unit area there would be. And keep in mind that these are not two-dimensional uh, pictures. I'm drawing them in two dimensions because I'm, I'm stuck on this. We'll look at three-dimensional versions. Technically, I could also draw lines. Let's look at the negative one. I could draw a line coming... Uh, from the screen directly into the page. I could draw one going back outwards. I could draw lines um, kind of coming, you know, you, see, you get the idea. You can draw lines uh, all around, but on a, on a two-dimensional page. This is usually how you'll see these type of things drawn. Electric field lines were first uh, used by a person named Michael Faraday, and he used them. He called them lines of force, but it, it was the same idea. Uh, he, he used these to eventually develop an understanding for how electric and magnetic fields can kind of interact with each other. Um, and we still use these ideas today because it's a really powerful idea. It's a good conceptual way to understand uh, what our electric field's like, okay? Now, I want you to look at these pictures, and I want you to think about the fact that uh, the negative one nanocoulomb one, there's this kind of flow of these field lines, right? They're all flowing inwards, almost like the negative one nanocoulomb charge is like a sink, and the field lines are like water being drawn into the sink. For the positive charges, on the other hand, it's like the lines are flowing out and away from the charge. So these field lines are, are kind of like a, well, it's like a sprinkler that's shooting a type of something away from this charge. In this case, it's electric field lines, right? Okay. These field lines are not the same thing as electric field vectors. We just know that at any point in space, if I come to this point right here, I would know that the electric field vector at that location should point along the field line. 
okay? Now, as I go farther out, I know that the electric field needs to get weaker, but I know that from a, you know, from what we've learned before. So there's, there's such a thing as what we call the field itself, which is a mathematical object that describes the electric field at every single point in space. That's one thing. And there's field lines, which are just a mathematical um, way to represent the shape of the field. Okay, do you feel like you all understand in general what these field lines are before I go into something that's a little more tricky? I have you kind of think about it. I think it makes sense. Okay, so what we'll do now okay. is we're gonna go back to, notice this word right here that came up earlier. The first example we did today, we found the field of an electric dipole at different points, right? This type of object, a dipole, shows up a lot in not only physics, but in other sciences as well, I'm sure. When you took your uh, chemistry courses, you probably talked about polar molecules. But um, dipoles are kind of an important object within electricity because uh, uh, it's, it's simple to study for one thing, but also uh, they kind of come up a lot. In, in um... so, so let's look at the, the field lines of a dipole then. Okay. So for this... Uh... Kind of probably should just put like a let's start off with a line that we can use to kind of balance things around and maybe we'll remove it later so for my dipole what i'll do is uh i'll use a positive i'll use a uh, a red marker for the positive charge a blue marker for the negative charge i'll put them i guess we'll put them that far apart and now what we want to do is we want to start drawing some electric field lines okay so what i'll do first uh, in red is I'm going to go to different places and we're going to try to draw uh, what the direction of the electric field at that point is, okay? So let's start at the places where it's going to be really simple. What's the direction of the electric field due to the negative charge at this location here? Right in the middle. What way does it point? Left. Left, Left. exactly. So draw a little vector like that. We'll call that one E minus. Now I'm not going to, I'm not going to write this everywhere, but just keep in mind that every time I draw a blue line, put a little key up here, that's going to represent the electric field at that location for the negative charge. Okay, what's the direction of the electric field for the positive charge? Right. And you're tempted to say also, right because one's negative sorry, left, positive. Left, yeah, yeah. Left, in, left. in this case, they both actually point to the left. And if done properly here, these should probably both be exactly the same length because, um, well, I, I kind of picked a point that was right around the middle, right? Now, that same thing that we just said about these points in between here is going to be true all along this line right here, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of our vectors and just say that black line is actually a field line now and it points this way. Now let's go to this piece over here on the negative side. What direction does the electric field point, uh, let's say for the negative charge at this location on the left-hand side here? Right. Yep, so electric field goes that way and then what direction does the electric field go for the positive charge? Left. Now which one's bigger? The negative Minus. one. And why? The blue one. Why is it bigger? It's close. Because it's closer. Charge. Exactly. So that means that to the left of the charge over here, we know that basically the electric field vector that was associated with this region over here is basically going to point to the left. And by the same argument, you can prove for yourself that this one over here should point uh, to the right. <laughs> Oops. By the same argument, in this region over here, we better do it. If I pick a point here, the, the plus is going to be bigger than the minus, right? And the minus will go that way, the plus will go this way, right? So in general, on the right side over here, our field lines are going to be... There we go. By the way, this is, in case that wasn't clear, this is our positive, and this is our negative. I really should put that on there. So out here, the field line looks like it's going to go like that. Okay, so all along kind of what we might call a normal x-axis, we figure out the direction of our electric field. So now let's see if we can do it at some more complicated places. So. What if we chose a point that is exactly in between the charges right here? Like right there. What direction is the field going to go? For the negative charge, what do I draw? Towards it, away from it? Towards it. Okay, and the positive charge, towards or away? Way. Way. Yeah. And this, just like the problem we did earlier, turns out that uh, the, the, the net electric field vector between, because now we have to add them together, right? The net electric field vector should probably point something like that, right? Now, what if I had chosen a point that was like, let's say, up here? 
Well, positive charge, point away. Negative charge, points towards. So again, you get a field vector that kind of points that way. In fact, basically, if we were to draw a line down the screen like this, all of the electric field vectors along this line are going to point this way. Do you all agree? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So undo, undo, undo. Oops, not redo. Get that line off there. Okay. So we kind of know within this region that we've got... Yeah, we're just going to get rid of all of them because I don't, I don't have the patience to deal with some of these things right now. Let's get rid of all of this stuff. So, so what that means is that if I were to draw an electric field line in this region, uh, I would know that when you get to like points like this right here, it's going to have to kind of be flat, right? Because one of the rules was our electric field lines have to be um, tangent to the field vector at that point. So that's kind of a piece of our field, our field line. It's going to be something like that right there. So then we kind of have to investigate what happens, let's say, at these two points. At this point over here, for the positive charge, our electric field goes up this way, right? I don't need to keep writing E plus. Stop doing that. And for the negative charge, the electric field now kind of goes down a little bit at an angle. And it's weaker. So when I add those two vectors together, I'm going to get a vector that kind of points up this way, right? And I'm just going to skip it because I want to keep going through this. The point at this way is going to kind of point down like that. When you're closer to the positive charge, it's going to point up away from the positive charge. When you're closer to the negative charge, it's going to point down towards the negative charge. So let's put all that together. Oh my god, what is it doing? All right, stop. I just want to click that one. No, oh, what is it doing? Okay. I wonder if you all think I should just get a new program. Can you get a feel? for how the line should go from there to there now. Mm -hmm. It's going to be like a curve, right? So I'm going to try to sketch a little curve in here. It's going to be really bad, but it's going to do something like that, basically, right? OK. So now what I want to do is I want to kind of, so what, this is annoying, because I want to get rid of, oh, there we go. That's fine. We'll do that. So I'm going to kind of go through here and sketch in general what's going to happen, because it's going to follow a general pattern just like that. We're going to have lines that do stuff like this. I'm going to kind of curl up this way. I can't have lines cross. And then I'm just going to have these lines kind of bend away from each other as we go. This. I'm going to do a really horrible job of this unless I go fast. So I'm going to kind of start going a little bit faster here. Because if I don't do like sweeping motions, it's going to be very difficult to get. Oops, I'm already breaking some rules here because some of these lines are crossing. So something like that. Oh, it looks so bad. OK. Soon enough, I'm going to show you what one of these is actually supposed to look like. On the bottom, let's see if I can do better on the bottom. Should be exactly symmetrical. Okay, something like this. If you play with magnets at all, you may have recognized a pattern like this before. But notice, every one of the lines has to leave the positive, and then it has to go back into the negative. You know, I feel like the last time I did this, it was on a chalkboard, because I think a year ago now, I would have been in the... Uh, it would have been, um, you know, pre-COVID. Now we have to basically just, we have to meet all of our rules, right? I'll just make these ones go off to infinity. So I don't have to keep drawing them, but we've got to obey all of our rules. So there's some rules being broken here. Some rules being broken here because lines are crossing. That's not supposed to happen. The lines should be evenly spaced. Okay, I can't, I can't do it. Job. But luckily there's, there's some programs out there that can kind of do the stuff for us. So that's what we'll look at next. All right, so I have uh, all this stuff linked on... Uh, I have all this stuff linked on the um, the canvas page, right? So let's go through and let's see if we can we can uh, we can see some of these properties by uh, by looking at this here. So I start off with a positive charge as a charge one, right? This is one of the first things that we drew. We've got vectors and arrows that point away like this. This is showing up, okay, right? It looks like it is. So if I were to double the charge you get double the number of lines, basically, right? So that meets what we said before. If we triple the charge, triple the number of lines, and so on and so forth, up to five. So that's the maximum number of lines we can get on there. You can see right in this region right here that the lines are extremely dense, which indicates that is a, a place where the electric field is very, very strong. All right, let's go back down to our dipole then. 
So our picture had the negative charge on the left, right? So we've got negative, 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 negative. So watch what happens when we change this to a positive. There we go. You see these kind of curvy lines like this, right? And that's our, uh, that's our field of a dipole. It turns out that if you take a magnet, you put a bar magnet down on a table, you put a piece of paper over it and then drop iron filings on top of it, it produces a really similar pattern, just like this, which may have been what kind of helped uh, Faraday to understand that we might want to do something like this. If we double both of the charges, so we're keeping them equal, then you double the number of field lines, the, the, the picture starts to get more and more compact. Now you can compare this to my horrible diagram if you want to, and see it has roughly the same features, but it doesn't break any of the rules, right? And you can also see, at least right here in the middle, there's a line similar to what we drew. And then of course the lines curve away like this. It might be worthwhile to ask what happens if, for example, the, the positive charge is twice as big. And then we get something like this, where what's happening now is, as I said in one of the rules, uh, some of these lines are basically going off to infinity, meaning they never close back in. And the reason why is because the positive charge is twice as big as the negative charge so you need to have twice as many charges, twice as many field lines terminating on the positive charge. And you can go through and count if you want, maybe a little easier if we go down to two and negative one to do the counting. Let's do that. So how many lines actually terminate on the negative? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, looks like nine. How many leave the positive? One, two, three, four, five, six. I don't think I counted that right. It's like 20. So it's not, this thing isn't exactly following all the rules that I set up there, but it's at least roughly doing the same thing. Okay, one other thing that might be interesting to look at is when the charges become the same. And you get a pattern that looks something like this. Okay. Some weird things happening here in the middle. I don't know what to make of that. This is just a kind of simulation, so I don't think it's exactly right. This looks better to me. I don't know what was happening with the lines in the other one, because you had some strange places here where two lines crossed each other. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Maybe this one's better. This one's better. There we go. Because now the lines are, they look like they look like they're touching, but it's more like that they're kind of asymptotically approaching each other, right? You might also notice that if you cover up half of the picture, you almost reproduce the electric field of just a single point charge, almost as if the, the, the field lines are kind of bending away from each other. Okay, does anyone have any questions or comments? Is there anything else you want me to try with this? This is, again, it's linked on the um, on Canvas. Okay, so that's interesting and all, but we also have this three-dimensional version. Okay. Now, this allows us to do more than, more than the other one did because, oops, um, what we have here is a point charge. Let's make it uh, positive. There we go. This actually shows the vector field, right? This is an actual proper vector field where at every single point in space, there is a three-dimensional vector. So that means it has how many components would each one of these vectors have? Three. Three components, right? That means that at every point in the space around this charge, you could draw a vector that represents the electric field, and that's what those are. Now, this is not field lines. This is field vectors. It's the vectors of the field itself. And they indicate strength by uh, brightness. So the white ones are the strongest, and the darker green ones on the outside edge here, those are the field lines that are the weakest, right? Even along the slice of the square on the top, you can see that there's a variation in the field strength because it's a radial field, right? Which means these lines right here, these field vectors, are gonna be stronger than the ones on the corners, right? Lots of things we can do with this. You can change the vector density, like we can get way more vectors in there like that. And then you almost stop seeing the vectors and just start seeing the brightness of the, the charge. It also <laughs> seems to lag a little bit with that many objects. We'll go back down again. You can go down to a very small number of vectors like this. Maybe it's a little easier to observe that way. Uh, you can change brightness. Uh, we can reverse it so that it's an inward field for a negative charge. And then we can go even further so we can see that uh, what the field lines look like. So there's the proper electric field lines that actually include all three dimensions. 
And I, I guess there's not really a direction here, is there? What happens when we reverse it? Nothing. They're just lines. There's no arrows associated with them. Okay. We can add in here a dipole. So there's the dipole. We could choose to look at just the, the, the field vectors again if we want to. It doesn't look like there's any order to it almost when you look at the field lines like that. But if you cut a slice, you can actually play around with it like this. You can do like a Z slice, and you can see the field vectors like that. You can do all kinds of stuff with this. It's pretty, pretty handy. Uh, the more lines you put in here, you start to see the nature of the field and see that it's kind of curving around like this. Oops, there we go. It's kind of curving around like, if I keep clicking it like that. And then if you throw on the field lines, you get this kind of really pretty picture. It kind of looks like a spider or something. Uh, and all kinds of other stuff you can do. Now, the next thing that we're going to do in this class is we're going to start looking at kind of more complicated objects. So we'll start looking at stuff like um, this one. So what this is, is a finite line. And I turn these way down. So what we have here is basically there's a, a charge that is smeared out over an entire line, basically. And it's negative. Let's make it positive. There we go. So it's a positively charged object, so all the field vectors point away. And as we increase the vector density, I don't know if it's obvious to see what's happening here, but these field lines are kind of all emanating out from that charge. And if we go back to the field lines themselves, we get really tricky. So there's some similarity to this one. And I wonder if I can put these side by side. This one right here. Where did it go? There it is. Can you see the similarity between these pictures? So this one is a, a positively charged object that's been smeared out. This is just two positive charges that are separated from each other. But there's this, the lines themselves kind of bend away in a very similar sense with this straight line in the middle. So that's something we're going to try to do next, is understand this right here. Oh boy, that's just awful, isn't it? It's just terrible. OK, does anyone uh, have any questions about electric field lines? They begin on positives, they end on negatives. The number of field lines leaving the positive charge is proportional. Lines can't cross, and any field line is tangent to the field vector. These are going to be very useful to us in this class, not just with electric fields, but also with uh, magnetic fields. OK, uh, are you all ready to move on to doing continuous charge distributions now and look at a line of charge? Can I have totally. any questions? So this is the problem we're going to be doing. This problem is in your textbook. and. Um, problem is in your textbook. Uh, it shows up in pretty much every single electricity textbook that's ever been uh, written, really. So the field of a charged line segment. Now, there's a method by which we're going to do this that I'm going to teach you while we're doing it. Um, because uh, I think if I just show you the theory, it's not going to be very meaningful to you. But uh, yeah, positive charge Q is distributed uniformly along the y-axis between y equal to negative A and y equal to positive A. Find the electric field at point P on the x-axis at a distance x from the origin. This is the field of a charged line segment. So basically what we have is we've got like a rod of some type. It could be like a piece of plastic maybe. And it has um, some length to it like this. And it goes between negative A and positive A. So right on top of this, we're going to draw uh, an x, y axis. Like that. We'll erase the piece on the left. We'll center this as much as I can in the center of this object. That looks pretty square. And then we'll just erase this piece over here, which I can only do with the stylus. Um, Okay, so there's our uh, there's our line, 
And the idea is that positive charge has basically been smeared across this object. So contained within this is just a whole bunch of, well, let's just say it's a rod that's been removed of, been stripped of a bunch of electrons. So that positive charges have been basically just effectively uniformly spread throughout this object. And our goal is to figure out what the electric field created by such an, such an arrangement is. It's a uniform distribution, okay? And it says that the positive charge Q, so there's a total charge Q over the entire rod, that's the total charge. And it goes from negative A to positive A. So the, the Y coordinate of this point down here is gonna be negative A. This point up here is gonna be positive A. So that's our Y direction, right? That's positive Y that way. And then positive X is gonna point off to the right. All right. And our goal is to find the electric field created by this, okay? And before we do that, uh, just it's worth like just thinking for a second. How would you go about doing that? We've learned how to find the electric field of a single point. How do we um, take that farther? How do we build on that idea of the field? What's up? Do we use an integral? We are going to use an integral. That's right. Um, and, and, and how are we going to use an integral then? We're going to break it up into small charge elements. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to take this object, we're basically going to cut it up into tiny little pieces and say that each one of those pieces will act like a point. We know the electric for a single point, and then we're going to use the techniques of calculus to sum over the entire object. Okay. But at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're cutting out of our object here, let's say at this point right here, we're going to cut a tiny little piece of charge out of here. Okay, and we could call that charge Q if we wanted to. But because we're going to use some calculus, we're going to call the amount of charge that we cut out of there to be DQ. And I'll just say up here, DQ represents a small piece of charge of the objects. So this DQ represents the amount of charge. The little d, uh, the little d basically just means that um, it's tiny. Okay, it just means that it's a small amount of charge. Okay, and then what we'll do is we'll say the electric field created by such an object at some point, and it says at a point p at a distance uh, x from the origin, right? So the origin's going to be right here. Uh, let's put our point p like here, maybe. Oops. Put our point P right here. Uh, we'll label on the side. And then just say, if I had a little tiny piece of charge like this, then at this location, it would create an electric field. And since it's a positively charged object, what direction would the electric field vector at this location be? Oh, away to the right. Yeah. Oh, look at that. That was great how I started it here, but it... Go away. Delete. Okay. I don't think I should get a different program instead of OneNote. If you have recommendations, let me know. This is becoming pretty tiresome, all these glitches that it has. So if I draw a line from there to there, uh, that line is going to be a distance what we call R away. And then on the other side of it, we'll draw our field vector, which should point um, like this basically exactly parallel to that line. Oh, I moved it just a little bit at the end. Is that, no, that's not quite right. Okay, let's put it on top of this. We'll get it fixed. Okay, now it's parallel. Now we can move it down here. Now, since this is a tiny piece of charge, we're going to label this. We'll give this field a name, and the name that we're going to give to it is going to be a D. And the general idea is going to be that every single point on this object can probably be described mathematically. Each one of them will produce some little DE like this. And from there, we can um, do some integration, basically. But that's kind of our, our goal, our strategy, basically, at least. OK? All right, so to do that, uh, there's going to be kind of a, a trick we use here. 
let's say that the um, well, let's let's label a couple things here. First of all, let's call the y coordinate of dq to be y. Uh, this is already labeled as x right here. This is x is not going to be a variable in this problem, okay? Uh, but y will be, and y is going to represent the position of any piece that we choose. And as a result, since we're cutting a piece out of this right here, we're going to say kind of the the thickness of the cut is going to be dy. All right, that's kind of the size of this cut that we're making out of this object. All right. And then what we'll do is we're going to connect the dy to the dq, okay? Now, it might not be obvious why we should do that first. So maybe, maybe the first step should be actually defining what de is going to be equal to. Now, the vector de, it's, it's a vector for sure. But if I drop the vector sign, then I'm, I'm basically talking about the magnitude. Uh, what I would say is that we have this formula for the electric field of a point charge. And it just says you take the charge, you divide by the distance squared. There's nothing wrong with just saying, okay, well, let's call that charge dq. And does, does this statement make sense to everyone? Yes. Yes. You don't have any questions? Don't really worry about these Ds, okay? Just don't worry about them now. I, I think that... I, I, I can't speak for everyone. I can just speak for what I remember when I was studying this, which is that this type of stuff, when I would see a little D like this, I was trained in calculus at that time, right? I know a lot of you were taking calculus classes, so immediately you want to think about calculus. Um, I, I would emphasize that if you start immediately thinking about calculus right now, you're missing the point. Uh, this has nothing to do with calculus that I've written down. Not yet, at least. It's just saying that a small piece of this object would produce a electric field that's going to be k times the size of the charge divided by the distance from this point to this point squared. Just magnitude, right? Anyone have any questions about that statement? Okay. Now, one thing you might be tempted to do if you're immediately thinking about calculus is be like, oh, I'll just integrate this. And then you might say, oh, well, there's dq, uh, k is a constant, and r has nothing to do with q. So, well, this is just going to be k times q over r squared. Then what are you going to use for your limits? Do you, <laughs> do you integrate from 0 to q or something like this? Anyway, you can't do that. It's uh, something that... Ooh, what was that? That was weird. Okay. Uh, so what instead we're going to do is we're going to try to make sure that we can that we can rewrite our dq uh, and use um, this variable y. And the reason we want to do that is because these dqs for our object, right, we could think of cutting something out down here. We could think of cutting something out down here. And for every one that we choose, you're going to get a different electric field vector, right? For this one, you're going to get an electric field vector that points this way. For that one, you're getting an electric field vector that kind of points up that way, right? Every one of them is going to point in a different direction. And so that means knowing the y-coordinate is going to help us with that direction, right? Because the closer that this object is to the center, the more that the electric field is going to tend to point like that. It matters where you are. What on earth is it doing when it's just... Okay, I don't know. Okay, so we need to find a way to write dq in terms of dy. And here's how we're going to do it. Um, we're going to say that there has to be some type of way to relate um, dq to dy. And we know that um, this is charge and this is length. So we need to multiply by some type of a conversion factor. And in this case, I would argue that it's this. This quantity is a constant. So Q, the total charge on the object, divided by the length of the object, that, that's a constant, right? It's uniformly distributed charges. So this equation right here is very similar to like a density equation, right? You know, mass equals density times volume or something. This says charge equals linear density of charge multiplied by the size of the length of the piece that we choose, right? 
in case what I've written here is somewhat confusing, let me give you some numbers to use to think about this. Suppose I have an object, okay? And I tell you it has a length L and it has a charge Q that's distributed all throughout it, right? And let's say that the length L is five meters. And let's say that the charge Q is 10 coulombs. If I now were to cut a piece out of this object, and let's say that I cut a piece that is um, a meter long, okay? So I break my object into one, two, three, there we go. I break it into one meter segments, right? Like this. Can you tell me how much charge is located in this first meter right here? How much charge is in there? Two. Two. Coulombs. two coulombs, right? That's easy, right? And how did you do that? Well, maybe you thought, th there's probably a lot of different ways different people did it, but you thought, well, it's a 10 coulomb object that's been broken up into five parts, so you take a fifth, right? 10 over five, which is two. Or maybe you just did it in your head, because the numbers here are really easy, right? But what did you do mathematically? What you said was the amount of charge that you picked in this part right here, right, Q, ended up being equal to some fraction Q over L, and you also had to multiply by a meter, right? That's really what you did if you wanted a more general way of doing it, if the numbers weren't good or something, right? And this, of course, allows the units to work out, right? Can you see how this is the same thing as what we're doing up here? We're saying the charge is equal to this thing. And by the way, this has a name. I might as well name it for you. It, your, your book uses the symbol, lambda. It represents uh, linear charge density. It's basically charge, charge per unit length, if you think about it. That's all it really means. It's the charge per unit length. And yeah, we basically just did this. dq was equal to that fraction lambda times dy. That's what we did. This is going to be a really useful expression for you when you do problems in this class, OK? All right. Let us move this off the screen for now. And oops. stuff up again right. so that'll still be on the notes but I still want to keep working on this problem all right just need to get that thing there we go okay so is everyone on board what we're doing here mm -hmm. and why I made that change any questions at all don't don't hesitate to ask in chat if you have questions okay so let's start putting this stuff together all right. Now I've uh, I've left some of the story up, but uh, we'll we'll wrap back around to that. So we've got a k. Our dq is now going to be replaced with q divided by two a multiplied by d dy now, and then divided by r squared. Now this is the part that I left out. This is a vector. So any type of thing I want to do with this vector. I'm going to have to do vector addition, basically, right? However, this problem, similar to one of the problems that we did earlier in class, has a lot of symmetry. If I go down here to a position, and I pick a position that is exactly the same distance away, let's say we call it y, from the first one that we chose right here, then what happens is that you get some nice cancellations that occur. So if from this location I were to draw a line back to here, hopefully I put those roughly the same distance away. Boy, it doesn't look like it, does it, though? I would need to go down a little bit, right? Okay, it's good, it's good enough, actually, I think. Uh, if this was a chalkboard, I would, I would measure it and stuff like that, but unfortunately, I don't have a measuring tool on here. Okay, so now, then at that location, the electric field for the lower object would point uh, basically up like this. I'll do my best to make it exactly the same. And I would argue that if you choose the exact same point on the opposite side, then these two electric fields... Maybe we call this one like DE prime or something like that. Uh, they should have um, the same Y component, right? They all just cancel out. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to notice that this angle right here, I'll just label it as theta for now. But that same angle appears right here and right here. And if we were to draw 
field vectors over here, do different color, I guess. If we draw the components of this, then the y components, we could call this one like d e prime y. And then we could draw the y component for this one right here. We go this way, we could call that one d e y. And in general, we basically say that the, the d e y's will all cancel or the y components cancel. So all we're left with is just the x component. That's all we have to find is this component here, the x component. And I'm going to label that to be dex. So that's all we have to find. And what we know is that that value dex, continuing with our equation right here, is going to be related to de, right? How are they related to each other? It's 404, okay. By the cosine. Yeah, the x component should be related to the cosine of this angle right here, which is what we're calling theta. These are all the same theta. So we multiply by cosine theta. So now we actually have something we can work with. Because we're in component form, now we don't have to worry about vector addition anymore. Everything gets added just like numbers get added. You know, 1 plus 1 is 2 instead of, you know, 1i plus 2j is equal to, I don't know, what, square root of 5 or something like that. So, um, dx, this is, again, still just the electric field for just one piece, should be equal to our value right here that we wrote down. So it's got a kq over 2a in it. I'm pretty sure all of this stuff is constant, right? multiplied by a dy, and now we've added a cosine theta from here, and we have to divide by r squared. And I believe everything in parentheses here all depends on each other, right? Because r is related to y, right? The larger the value of y, as if I picked a value of, of, of y that was like up here at the end, at y equal to a, what happens to r? Does it get bigger or smaller? What happens to the value of r if I come up to a point up here and I pick out another piece dq? It, it becomes greater. It becomes greater. So it's very clear that y and r are related to each other, right? And this is a, a dy, which we're, we're going to do an integral with now. So we need to make sure that we get everything into one variable. We need dy, cosine theta, and r to be in one variable. Hopefully you can also see that theta is going to be directly related to r as well, right? So that's what I'm going to give you to do over this. We're going to take a break. I'm going to have you think about this. See what you can do to um, come up with a way to write each one of these things all in terms of um, constants and theta. So. I want you to write dy, turn it into